hacking the DNA, because like uh, Oscar already said, it's surprisingly digital, which also makes it sort of our thing, in a way. And part of hacking DNA, the way professionals do it, is remarkably using words like that we know, like there's even a thing called shellcode in there, which is just like the shellcode that we know. So I'm going to start off very briefly uh, by thanking all the people that made all the nice uh, pictures that I uh, lovingly borrowed for this presentation. If you go to the URL, you can see the credits exactly who made them. Um, Oscar already introduced me. Um, so I'm, I'm not originally a biologist, but I started studying DNA in 2001. And over time, apparently, I managed to fool some people. Uh, that I'm a real biologist, so I, I was allowed to do some research in uh, Delft University. And, um, and uh, some of you may know me from a presentation on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, which was read by uh, 1.7 million people. It's an interesting thing. That means that a lot of people really, really care. But I've never written anything that was read by 1.7 million people. So apparently, we want to know about this DNA stuff. Um, I also managed to fool some magazines into publishing my research. Um, but but it's for real, and it's a sort of a joke. I fooled them. No, this is real research, and it turns out that if you are thinking like a reverse engineer, if you are thinking about big data sets, you can go to DNA and invent stuff that other people have not seen before. So, and, and you, you could do that if you had oodles of free time, uh, but then you could do that. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, manipulating DNA. But I want to make it very clear that I'm talking here about the technology, I'm telling how it works. I'm not here to tell you, hey, you should all go out and hack your DNA, or your dog's DNA, or your partner's DNA. No, don't do it. And I'm also here to pour a little rain on the parade, where you might have gotten the impression that we have CRISPR now, and you can just CRISPR DNA in any way you want, and it will do what you want, and it's no. It doesn't. So that was the bad news. The good news is that some really cool things really are happening. But we are not about to be in a place that uh, you could mod my, modify my DNA and I would become thin. Um, you could, however, modify my DNA and I would be dead. Yeah, that's entirely possible, but let's not, not go there. So DNA. Um, millions or billions of nucleotides or bases. Uh, so we. We all exist, uh, contain around 3.3 billion bases of DNA. That's what we always thought. Later, we found out that some people have like 6% more DNA than other people. There's a lot more variation between us than we thought. This is a relatively recent uh, discovery. And while our binary stuff is 0 and 1, in DNA, we have four molecules, and we call them A, C, G, and T. And these are organized in chromosomes and cream, uh, genes. And what blows my mind, and it should blow your mind as well, and if it doesn't blow your mind, I will give you free beer. We have four billion years of life, and it is all using atom for atom the same DNA. Now, when I look back at my presentation five years ago, I already could not read some of the files I had made, because by that time, the software had changed. This is four billion year old code. And it's still using the same molecules. It's, yeah. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. <laughs> so there are some more analogies. We have DNA. DNA is like super stable. Um, we sometimes can dig up uh, Neanderthals or other ancient uh, organisms like 100,000 years ago, and we can still read their DNA. I cannot read the CD-ROM from 10 years ago, um, which contains less information. So that is like super, super solid stuff. But it's so solid that like a CD-ROM, it doesn't do anything by itself. So there's RNA, which is a far more active form of DNA, but it degrades in days or hours. And from RNA, we build proteins. We are all proteins. We are a room full of proteins. Our skin are proteins, our hair, 
uh, our nails, etc. So we are built out of proteins, but the proteins also do stuff. So that's really the doing things of life, the components of life, and these are made out of amino acids, which are like little Lego blocks, and you put them together and you get a protein. So how much DNA is there? Um, and this is a sort of impressive list. We have viruses like that are 800 bytes. These are true artists. There's 800 bytes that can make you really ill and unhappy. And, and then, of course, there is the famous one, SARS-CoV-2, 7.4 kilobytes. In the room with us right now, I almost guarantee it to you, 7.4 kilobytes. It caused a little bit of disruption. Um, then we go up to a bacterium, 750 kilobytes. It's is sort of doable. You can read a bacterium, and people actually sort of go through all of the DNA of a bacterium and learn stuff, and we'll also do that later on. And a typical human being is 750 megabytes. And that goes for everyone. Even if you are larger, it's still 750 megabytes of unique DNA. So how do we go from DNA to these proteins that build us? And that's this little machine. This is the world's most impressive 3D printer. This is the ribosome. And you see this chain that goes in that says, uh, 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 best, best not to read it that way. And that goes through, and that assembles the yellow things that attract the purple or pink amino acids that make these proteins. Biologists are sometimes very strange people. When the protein is small, they call it a peptide. And no one knows when it becomes a protein. This is how they roll. And um, they love messing with you. I'll, I'll get some more examples of that. So this little machine is a 3D printer, or actually it's a 1D printer, because it takes this ribbon of RNA and turns it into a ribbon of amino acids. And then, interestingly, this ribbon self-assembles and folds itself up into all kinds of interesting shapes. There was a lovely movie here. Ah, there is a lovely movie here that you can see, but I cannot. Let's see if I can make it play. Yes, it works. But this is the same thing. In black, you see this RNA chain going through the machine. Then all these things fly in and out, and they bring the amino acids, and you see that gray thing coming up there, and that is the amino, the amino acids being assembled into a peptide or a protein. And this just goes on and on. And if you watch this presentation at home, it goes on for multiple more minutes because all kinds of cool things. So now a thing flies in. Let's see, does it come? Uh, well, it's taking its time. OK, you should just watch this at home. Ah, there it goes. Whoop. Well, it just goes on and on. And this happens within you right now. Even as we speak, billions of, of proteins are being assembled. Now, how do we know how does the thing know? Yeah, is it working? Yeah, it's working. This is the instructions for an important protein. And it actually fits on one screen. And, um, and when this is made, and then another protein is also made, and if you want to impress biologists, a protein always starts with an M. So if you ever see one that doesn't start with an M, you can say, like, you're wrong, Mr. Biologist. So it's just a little trick. So here's another protein. It's a bit smaller. And when these two assemble, they combine into one of the most impressive materials known to man. I have it here for you, human skin. Which, if you think about this, is a really impressive piece of technology. It can stand water, it doesn't tear, it disinfects itself. And the source code for a key part of that is on these two screens. It continues to blow me away. So this is a table of the opcodes of an ancient CPU. This tells you if you put these bytes into this CPU, it will do the following things. If you look at this table, you can already see that some thought went into that. So there are all, all columns that are empty, where the designers were probably planning to do new things, but they left space. And in some places, they left a little bit of room in between. So you can see some sort of structure in there. If you study this, you might understand something about the people that made the 6502 CPU. We have this 2,300-year-old rock. And on this are, is one boring document written in two scripts of Egyptian and ancient Greek. 
And because it's the same document three times, this stone helps us understand how language developed maybe 3,000 years ago, 2,300 years ago. It's a very impressive rock. This is the table that does DNA and amino acids, and it's four billion years old. This is a lot cooler than the rock. Um, if you stare at this thing, the more you learn about this table, so we see, for example, that uh, CGG maps to arginine. And you have these other few things, there are TAA, TAG, and TGA map to stop codons. That means the protein ends here. Stop whatever you are doing, you're done. There are three of them, probably very important. The more you stare at this table, the more you start to see structure in there. And some people are really convinced that someone designed this table. I don't think it was designed by someone, but still, the more I look at this table, the more sort of impressive it becomes. How do we know that it's four billion years old? We can actually trace the evolution of life. We now think that it started in these sort of black smokers or some, something close to that. But we know from the way this split up that the code has not changed for at least two billion years and probably longer. I find that impressive. Now, finally, we're going to talk about hacking the genome and editing DNA. Why would you even do it? Because if you mess with it, you might make it worse. Well, first, there are people walking around and they have terrible diseases. Probably some of you in the room have that and you would like to have that fixed. And sometimes we just know there's this little bit of DNA that's wrong. If only we could change one thing, your life would be a lot better. But we also have people walking around with unfavorable DNA that we know that you are at risk or maybe at risk of severe disease later in life. You might not want to be at risk of severe disease, disease later in life. The other way we manipulate DNA is to get bacteria to work for us for free. There are our angels that way. And we have get these bacteria to make vaccines, hormones, and medicines for us. All the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that we got against corona, almost all of them came out of bacteria, which is very nice of them, because usually we associate bacteria with bad things happening. This is one of the good things happening. Um, we might one day also convince bacteria to fixate carbon dioxide for us, which would be really nice, because they can do that kind of thing, if only we could tell them that they should do it. And maybe one day they'll listen. We also can manipulate DNA to instruct our immune system to fix cancer, which is nice. And finally, that's the part where it's going to be lots of very active, you could also win the Tour de France if you mod modify your own DNA. And there are also going to be people that need bigger body parts and would like to manipulate their DNA. And it's probably going to be happening. Don't do it. So what could go wrong with DNA? Sometimes there's just a typo in there. One thing changed, it's just one letter, it should be a C, it's a G. And that could already disable a whole gene. Or it could, the gene could still work, but now do the wrong thing. The other thing that sometimes happens is there are people that come from regions where there was lots of malaria, and they have DNA that protects them against malaria, which is nice. Uh, that DNA might also give you a blood disease, which is not nice. But it was a good trade-off when these people lived in, or their forebears lived in countries with a lot of malaria. Uh, one of the most terrible things that we recognize as computing people is let's say you have a serial connection, a serial connection, and you miss one bit, and everything now shifts one bit. That means that it becomes unintelligible. Nothing useful ever comes out again. DNA has the same issue because it takes three DNA letters to make one amino acid. If you take away one amino acid, all, sorry, one DNA letter, all the amino acids now shift and they all become wrong. This is very bad. And sometimes you just get a mutation that means that the gene stops in the middle, which is not good because you were attached, you also wanted the rest of it to work. So how long have we been uh, working with uh, modifying genomes? It turns out we've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years already, which is not what you might be expecting. And uh, for example, this, this wonderful wolf um, entered our lives 
and um, that thing downstairs is still substantially a wolf. <laughs> it's actually 99.9% .9 wolf. It did not improve, <laughs> I think. But we were able to do this because there was enough genetic variation in the wolf that if you just sort all the sort of good bits or the, yeah, the, the bad bits from the wolf, uh, you end up with that thing. So that's not changing DNA, it's just moving it around. The same thing, we see all these lovely and healthy vegetables on the right. These are all one plant. So the Brussels sprouts and the kale and the broccoli and the cauliflower are all one plant. Except someone bred it to emphasize different parts of the plant. But this is, if, if you have a DNA sequencer at home, which I do, um, you could sequence your Brussels sprouts and they would look, look just like broccoli. So this stuff all happened thousands of years ago and it did not require any special laboratory stuff. It just required sorting the variation that existed between the majestic wolf. So you take the smallest wolf from the litter, you take the nicest wolf from the litter, and in the end, well, you end up with that. And um, there's a lot of variation in here, and I'm going to skip a few slides, but this is a real picture, and that uh, sort of embodies the, the genetic variation uh, with, within cows. It is a real picture, but it must be said that the smaller ones are all female cows, and the big one is a steer, but still it's a very big cow. And, uh, and this is just not manipulating DNA, just moving it around. Uh, skip this one as well. Um, actually, so when people were breeding plants, sometimes there was not enough genetic variation in the plant to make an interesting plant. And people were bored, they had lots of time and no regulation. And at some point, someone figured out that if you just put some radioactivity next to a plant, it will mutate. And this creates some lovely flowers. And, um, and this has been done for, for decades already, and I think there are like 2,000 different plant species that were just generated by putting radiation into them and hoping that the plant would become better. And uh, it works. Don't do this on people. Um, they don't like it. So this was like extra, super, super special. Um, Diabetic people, or people with diabetes, many of them need insulin. And the insulin hormone is a very small protein. It should be simple to make, and we cannot do it. It's very interesting. We cannot do it. We need to get animals to do it for us. Before 1979, or even before 1985, if you wanted to make insulin, you had to slaughter hundreds of thousands of cows and pigs to get a tiny bit of insulin from them, which was wasteful and smelly and it was not good and they didn't like it and ridiculously early these people before they could even read DNA they had figured out how they could make the DNA that creates protein and put it in bacteria and these bacteria then said oh well we still speak the language after four billion billion years we understand your DNA humans we are now going to make insulin for you at first, they only made a little bit of insulin until they understood that bacteria do speak the same DNA, but they have a different dialect. And by that, I don't mean they speak a different language, just they use different synonyms. So where animal DNA uses a lot of GCC as a codon, maybe the animals, or the, the bacteria use a different one. And in a ridiculously short amount of time, they could stop slaughtering these hundreds of thousands of animals and now insulin gets made by uh, bacteria and sometimes by yeast. It's like very impressive. But how do you do that? How do you get the bacterium to take your DNA and listen to it? It turns out bacteria also have sex. So it's nasty enough to know already that we are sort of inhabited by bacteria, but they're also doing things with their pilus. And... Um, and, and um, this means that if you get a bacterium in the right mood, it will just suck up DNA from the environment. And you are not going to believe this, but I swear it is true. With one of the most used bacteria for this kind of stuff, one way of getting them in the mood <laughs> is to feed them alcohol. <laughs> it really is true. But 
the biologists continue to mess with you. Once they have found a bacterium that is willing to take up DNA from the environment, by feeding it alcohol, for example, they call it competent. <laughs> Which is not what happens to me when you feed me alcohol. But anyhow, you give, there are other ways to get them, but this is one of the prime ways. You give them ethanol and they suck up DNA from the environment and they think like, hey, let's do this stuff. Okay, so that's very nice because these things make hormones for us, medicines, vaccines, so thank you. Um, adding DNA to humans, because we'd love to hear about human beings. How can we fix our DNA? How can we improve our DNA? And the thing is, there are lots of viruses around that already want to improve our DNA. And we do not want that. We are against that. So our DNA is very well protected, has lots of defenses against people messing with it. But there are a few viruses that can do it. And one of the most famous one is HIV, the one that gives you AIDS. It's like really good at inserting stuff in our DNA. And so they started making medicines and stuff with that, but people were like, are you injecting AIDS into me? So they now call them lentivirus, which is the same thing. Uh, but it sounds a lot better. So if, if someone says this is a lentiviral-based approach, so you're like, that's AIDS, right? But, but still, of course, they took out all the scary bits and stuff, so it, it works. But, um, but still, what this does is you take some DNA that you, you want to insert into a human being, you put it into this lentivirus, and that then goes to your genome and puts its stuff somewhere. Now, that's a bit of a problem. Um, there are other viruses that do it slightly smarter. There is an, a, a mysterious adeno-associated vector that we don't really understand why it exists at all. But it's a virus that takes a little bit of DNA and just leaves it in the nucleus. It doesn't insert it, just leaves it there, which is like very nice. And, um, and there's another way of doing it that was very disappointing to people. They said it's going to be like super hard to get DNA into a human cell and to integrate it. And someone said, can we try a really small injection needle? They said, no, that's not going to work. And it's, okay, it does work. And um, so this, it's, that, that, that works as the way you think it works. Just uh, someone with really good eyesight. And, and, and it works, but the problem is that person can only do one cell at a time. And um, to improve that, they also, these, these biologists, they cracked me up, they, they made a gun, a DNA gun. And they, and, and they put little gold balls in there, coated with DNA, and they go, Poof! and it's called biolistics. <laughs> and um, so that helps, because that, that can do like, like dozens of cells at a time. But the problem is we, we need to do a lot more than that. And the challenge we have there, it looks a little bit like this. These are so-called phone books. It's from, they were massive data leaks when, when sort of <laughs> telephone companies would print everyone's phone numbers in there. And you can see this is a lot. I estimate that each of these books contains around 200 megabytes of information, which is slightly less than a human being. But the challenge of editing human DNA is that you must search and replace through these books and through all of them. And you can see that it's going to be real work. Um, nevertheless, we can do it. Um, sickle cell disease. This is the one I mentioned that if you have uh, this makes you almost immune against malaria, but can give you very nasty blood disease and make you, can make you extremely unhappy. And this is now, I almost, yeah, I think this is fixed. I think we got this, we got the solution for it now. But the reason why it works is you, this is a rare case where you can take cells from your blood out of the body into the lab. In the lab, they infected those cells with viruses. They check it, everything went right. Then they make a lot more of these cells. Then you go back to the patient, remove those cells from the patient. That's the scary part for a bit. And then you put the fixed cells back in. And it works. It works tremendously well. It's also tremendously hard work. Um, but it uses one of these lentiviruses, and we know what that is, to insert a fixed gene. And it mostly gets inserted in the right place. Mostly. That's the sort of scary part. So how well does this work? Um, these are, on the left, are people before the treatment, and every red block there is a severe event where they had to visit the hospital because their sickle cell disease got them bad enough that they had to go to the hospital. And in yellow is the people that have been treated, and there are no red markers there anymore. 
Now, I have to warn you, you will read a lot about uh, successful gene therapy, and most of the successes are not that successful. Most of the news is hyped up. This is for real. This is 100% score. Maybe the light for 5%, it's, it's okay. But this is an extremely impressive result where we were able to just insert an improved gene and improve people's life tremendously. This one is also very impressive, cancer. We hate it. Fuck cancer. The way cancer survives is that it hides from our immune system. If our immune system could recognize the cancer cells, it would get rid of them. What we can do with gene therapy is educate some of our immune cells and say, look, this is what you should be doing. Pseudo kill the cancer cell. <laughs> and it actually does that. And this is not as successful uh, as, as this slide, so we're not in this territory yet, and it doesn't work for all cancers, but when it works, it's like tremendously impressive, and it worked because we were able to tell an immune cell, here are your DNA instructions, this is what you should look for. It's amazing. I'm going to skip this one because we mentioned it already, except for the last paragraph. This is a virus by which we can insert a tiny ring of DNA into a cell. It's very helpful from this virus. The biggest challenge is it's like really tiny. That means that only a very small payload fits in there. That means if you want to exploit it, if you want to put some shell code in there, it has to be like super, super brief. Finally, CRISPR. Who here has heard about CRISPR? Yeah. Well, it is nice. It really is nice because it allows me to show you this picture. This is a bacterial virus called a phage. That's for real. They really look like this. People go like, is this an artist impression? Well, the color is an artist impression. I have to admit that. Otherwise, this bacterial virus actually looks like this. And to prove that, on the right there is a photo. It actually does look like that. And how does a thing like this operate? In the head, there is a bunch of DNA. And then it does what you think it does. It goes, sits on a bacterium, and then bzzz, drills down, injects the DNA. So it's, it's, it really does that. And bacteria, they hate it. <laughs> they really don't like that. And, uh, and they want to put a stop to it. So many bacteria have specific enzymes that recognize specific DNA sequences. And when they say, when I see that DNA sequence, I'm going to kill it which is somewhat of a problem because that means that the bacterium itself should not have that DNA sequence because otherwise it would kill itself. If you do a simple statistical analysis on any bacterium, you find that they are actively avoiding some sequences because they know it would kill them. So, and by the way, I, this is my own invention and, and, and this, you can do this as well. If you download the DNA from a bacterium and you go hunt for rare sequences, you will find stuff and much of that stuff is not really known in the literature, because they are not big computer geeks over at biology. And we are. Now, CRISPR. And this is, CRISPR has been around for ages. It has been around for billions of years, but we knew about it for a very long time already. And the biologists, and I love them, by the way, I just want to clarify that, but they turned out their understanding was exactly the wrong way around. Because we knew that CRISPR was there, we could see it in bacteria, but we didn't know what it was doing. And what it looks like is you have um, bits of yellow repeating DNA. They're not yellow in real life, but repeating bits of DNA with some random stuff in between, which they called spacers. And everyone was really interested in what are these yellow things doing and, and these spacers. It turns out the spacers are the immune system of the bacterium. These spacers, they have in, in them copies of small parts of the DNA from the viruses that attack them. So in that DNA, there's an instruction, if you see the following DNA, kill it. And this can evolve, it can learn from new phages. But the risk, of course, is if you have this instruction, if you see this DNA, kill it, is that you start killing yourself. Which is like a virus scanner that detects itself because it's full of bad stuff. And nature has been clever about this. 
it always adds a few DNA letters before the killing sequence without actively mentioning them. So this is how the bacterium prevents itself from killing itself. It's like really nice. So what does CRISPR actually do? And I'm gonna skip a few slides, but I'm, the key thing is, you may think CRISPR is a thing that edits DNA. That's probably, is that, is that, is that what, what your impression was? I think CRISPR, yeah, I think so as well. It doesn't, it breaks DNA. The only thing it does, it breaks DNA. That's what it does. So if you think like, hey, I'm gonna edit my genes with DNA, that's a bit like I'm gonna edit, edit my genes with dynamite. I'm gonna tear them apart. And the trick that we do is we make the DNA kill itself with CRISPR, and then it's like really broken. And when that happens, we also inject a sort of suggestion to the cell, why don't you fix it like this? And then the cell, because it's like super broken, sometimes takes up our suggestion and fixes itself. So that's really nice. But if anyone tells you that CRISPR is there to uh, manipulate DNA, CRISPR is only there to break DNA. So the hype around CRISPR, if you hear from California, there are people are ready to CRISPR yourself into health. We're not there yet. We're not there in, in a long way. But in a lab, it does work. So you can do many things with it in a lab. But you cannot just shoot the CRISPR cannon at someone and hope that it changes all your DNA. And in fact, when you do that, if you deliver a CRISPR payload, if you inject it or whatever, your body goes like, oh, we need to break this down, send it to the liver. Which means that the liver is the only place that we can really CRISPR right now. Now, it's a good thing that the liver is one of your top 10 organs, so it is good news that we can add it there, but that's the only thing we can do with it. So it is not as hot as you would think. Now, more doom. Um, do we understand how DNA really powers life? Because if you're gonna change it, it's best if you knew what it was doing. And sometimes we do, and I really like this one. This is an important algorithm. Should I go to the kitchen? I should go to the kitchen if I'm hungry, and if there is food there. It's an important human algorithm. You shouldn't go to the kitchen if you're not hungry, and you should also not go there if there's no food. And in, expressed in a sort of C-like language, if I am hungry and there's food in the kitchen, go to the kitchen. We find this exact algorithm in bacteria. This is a piece of DNA, and if we are hungry, if the bacterium is hungry, that cap thing attaches to the DNA, and it says, can you please make this protein? But that's only the first condition, am I hungry? The other condition, is there actually something we can do about the hunger? And that's when there is lactose around. If there is lactose around, then the bacteria says, okay, I'm hungry, there is lactose, I'm going to convert glucose, I'm gonna make glucose from the lactose. We understand this one really well. That's because bacteria are nice. Bacteria are simple. Bacteria are like these tiny computer programs that we all rely on. Human beings are these giant blocks of Java enterprise shit. <laughs> and we have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. We're all made out of Java, people. And I want to give you a real example. When we started to look at, well, when, we, when the human genome was first sequenced, we thought we would find a list of all diseases in there. So this is the gene that makes you fat, this is the gene that makes you smart. It works nothing like that. And one of the first things people try to figure out is, well, what causes blue eyes? Because it's a very simple thing to test. You can just look at someone, do you have blue eyes? And then you can look at their DNA and see, can I find in the DNA what gives you blue eyes or not? And lo, we found it. We found a very powerful uh, mutation and it gives you blue eyes. So where is this mutation? Is it in a gene that has anything to do with eyes? No, it is in the HERC2 gene, which is involved with DNA repair. So there is a mistake or a change in the HERC2 gene, and that gives you a different eye color, which is, makes no sense at all. Then we found out that if you make this small change in the HERC2 gene, the OCA2 gene becomes less active. Well, thanks for that. Um, it's like, yeah, I only changed this little thing and now the whole stack is down. I don't know why. 
But anyhow, this tiny change in HERC2 suppresses the OCA2 gene. What does the OCA2 gene do? Well, uh, it makes the P protein. What does the P protein do? We don't know. Something, something with color. It also changes some other things in your life, in the color. But we don't really know. So that means that this is our level of understanding, and this is actually one of the best studied uh, mutations we have, because it's one of the first ones that was discovered, and it is caused by a mutation in an unrelated gene that suppresses a gene that we don't really know what it does, but it gives you blue eyes. So be careful when you tinker with DNA. Strange things might happen. Because this is the other pie chart that tells us what is all that DNA doing. And the red part, the tiny part over there, that's the part that we are reasonably sure what it's doing. And then there is stuff. And a lot of this stuff can be compared to if you have a, a, an old computer project and you have lots of files around and you change it a few times. There are now three directories called MISC. And, um, and there's actually, once, once we, we revamped it all, but we didn't finish it, but we left the files around because they might be useful later on. That's a lot of what you see in DNA. Uh, a lot of the other parts you see in DNA, so all kinds of viruses that have successfully infected the DNA, have meanwhile been killed, but yeah, it's just, we still keep it around for some reason. Um, there are a few plants that have cleaned up their whole genomes and kicked out everything that wasn't immediately useful, and we have very much not done so. But it turns out that these parts are important, because if there are changes in there, it turns out that we do change. For example, the, the blue eye gene is actually in a part of HERC2 that actually doesn't do anything. But it does change your eye color. Mm. The future, will you hack a genome and will it be yours? Um, is it loading? Yeah. This is stuff you can buy online. This is the Bento Lab on the left. It's really nice. Mini PCR on the right. This is pocket PCR. This is a USB powered PCR machine, you know, from the DNA tests. Um, you can just buy it, and it's super fun. I, I have all of these things, and I've done my first DNA experiments at home, and uh, I'm not even good at this kind of stuff. Uh, but I was able to just detect DNA and, 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 and see what was in there, and it works. And you can just order this stuff online. It's still somewhat special, but um, the machine on the right is actually a DNA sequencer that will read DNA. And it is actually this big. And uh, I pondered bringing it, but then I thought about how stuff breaks on campsites, so I didn't bring it. But you can buy that thing and read DNA in your own house. Um, if you want to order DNA, you can go to this site, Eurofins. You can just paste the DNA in there and click order. And then they send it to you. And then the billing process is extremely complicated. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but the ordering of the DNA is rather easy. Um, this is, you can buy this thing, CRISPR at home. And it's meant for CRISPRing plants, so you can do some experiments with that stuff. Uh, but you can order this and, and do it. Um, so it is coming closer to our world. Um, but don't do it because it will likely kill you or give you cancer. So just, I want to, as a disclaimer, <laughs> You can order this stuff, but don't do it. There are some people, however, that are willing to take risks. And uh, many of them are in the Tour de France. <laughs> and, um, and there are a bunch of genetic modifications that you could make to your red blood cells that might very well improve your cycling performance. And I think that these people also looked at this uh, page. And they're like, well, you know, if I don't win the next stage, then what's, what worth, what's my life worth anyhow? So, but the only way you're going to figure that out is you, if you actually sequence the DNA from a Tour de France cyclist and see that it changed. And you're like, hey, you have new DNA now. So, weird. Some predictions. Um, like I said, you might get the impression that we can just simply CRISPR your hair color soon, and probably not. Uh, but the stuff from the sickle cell disease and this pseudo kill a cancer cell stuff, that is going extremely fast right now. And that spent like 10 years in the lab, but it's now coming out of the lab and actually curing people. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that. 
And, but we will continue to focus on, on terrible disease because we're not quite ready yet to modify someone's DNA so that they get a bigger nose or whatever. Um, in the future, you might get, you might enter the territory that people say we can change your DNA because it will lower your risk of future disease. And that might be something that is worth it for, for some people, but this is already like 10 years in the future. And, um, but the thing is, so these are developments for like the next 10 years, but I'm a bit worried about the lower line because this technology is now so widely known uh, there might be people, not only Tour de France people, or just people with very scary diseases that have hope. Uh, and of course, uh, hope is, is, we want to give people hope, but it is now easy enough to, to mess up uh, your DNA. So, summary, we can make bacteria sing and dance for us if we give them a little bit of alcohol. And, uh, and they make things for us, which is nice. We can fix DNA cells in the lab, and that has saved the lives of many people now, because I could not even address all the ways in which this has worked. It is a lot harder to fix a living human being, but there are viruses that are willing to help, and it might well be that in the future we find a virus that is precise enough that will deliver a fixed gene in the right place, because right now it delivers it somewhere. We understand very little about what most of DNA does, and uh, we should be very careful tinkering with that. And the final line is really, your digital skills are really welcome in this field. So if you study DNA, it is entirely possible as an outsider with only a few years of hard work uh, to actually discover something that other people haven't seen because we are not scared of like hundreds of gigabytes of DNA. And, uh, and we have a reverse engineering mindset uh, that can very well be helpful. And with that, I would like to end my presentation and thank you for your uh, rapt attention. Excellent. Are there, is there even time for questions? Are there questions? There are microphones in the middle, and I can't really see if there is anybody there. Yeah. Hmm. And otherwise, if there are no questions, please, uh, please, if you have a question, please walk to the microphone. Yes, microphone one. Not working. Can you please perhaps even yeah. move up because on the stream we won't have any audio. Uh, can you, uh, there's another microphone in the back. Test, 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 test. That one does work, yeah. Yeah, so in the presentation at some point you showed there were two uh, life forms with one of them having three, 33 gigabytes. Yeah, you just crossed it. Yeah, there, the bottom two ones. Yeah. And I was interested to find out why, why so much. That's an extremely good question. And uh, for the marbled lungfish, people are not actually sure if it's only one fish. Uh, it might be actually two fishes with one genome. We're not really sure. Uh, but the other thing is that um, there is a theory that says that the more DNA you have, the more variation you can harvest which means that you could see, and this is an information theoretical approach, that you can see DNA as an antenna for harvesting potential information about improvements. And in a way, it might be good to have a lot of DNA. Um, it might also be accidents. History, biology is full of weird accidents. And uh, it is not unique. So it's not 33 gigabytes of, of unique DNA. It's lots of copies of the same DNA. Um, but the honest answer is we don't know. Sorry. Thanks, and thanks for the great presentation. Thank you. There's a lineup. Yes, next. 
so, hi. Uh, so you're saying that we can help, right? And so in what specific ways would software engineering skills be useful? Like what specific things? So I, I can give with? you a very nice example of that. Um, there are sometimes that biologists, they do uh, research on five bacteria. And they report, well, in these five bacteria, uh, the following restricted sequences are present. And we write a whole paper about these five bacteria. And you can read that paper. You can go to the website of the NCBI, which is the US agency that gathers all these genomes, and repeat the analysis not on five bacteria, but on 32,000 of them. And we can do that, because we know how computers work. And if we want to rent a big one, we rent a big one. And suddenly, you just amplified their work by a factor of thousands, and probably find lots of cases where their hypothesis is correct, where it is not correct. And this is simply a matter of scaling up work that was very difficult for those people, and that could be easy for you. And then you would maybe learn something about bacteria that before that we just didn't know. This Thank you. Hello. Sorry, I missed most of the of your vortrag, but um, I'm imagining that when we manage to manage the climate crisis afterwards, we should take care about plutonium and collecting it. So, and I imagine that we could create creatures or a food chain that would um, partially eat plutonium and collect it, and that way um, collect it so we can harvest it and put it together in one place, whatever, and treat it some, some way, which we have to invent. Um, what's your thought about it? Is this is a, sort of scary, a scary thought for you, that we could one day um, create a creatures or even food chain for this specific um, um, Einsatzgebiet? Yeah, I, so the, que the question, I think, is, could this be like really scary? And could we, for example, make a bacterium that just eats plastic? Uh, which would be nice for the bacteria, but it would sort of suck for all our plastic things. I think with plastic, it would be very different to um, draw the barrier between plastic and non-plastic things. So yeah. this would be very dangerous, in my opinion. I, I, th I think you're right, and, and we're still struggling with it. So the European Union has really said that you need to get permission to do anything with genes. So all, all this stuff I just described is a ton of paperwork in the European Union and not in the US. I'm not convinced that the paperwork we are letting people do here is even good enough to make sure that nothing scary happens. Mm -hmm. But just to, we could talk about this all night, but I'm pretty convinced that this stuff could be like really scary. Yes. So Thank don't you. do it, so don't do it at home. <laughs> is, is there a last short question? We have yeah. only time for one. I, I hope it's short, don't know. Um, for your blue eye example, you said there is some junk DNA that normally does nothing. Yeah. But in this case, it does. Yeah. So it obviously doesn't do nothing. Yes. Yeah, my question would be, how do we even determine which parts of the DNA do nothing? Yeah, so we don't. Um, there is, is, one, is one answer to it. We can take a cell and look at all the DNA that is currently being converted into RNA, which means that it's active. And then we check if we can find that RNA in the DNA. And if we do, you end up as one of as the red protein coding thing, or as the, well, no, there's not, it's not explicit here. But we can only really know the stuff that we see that is active. And for the rest, we don't know what the influence is. So, and also, I, I should, if I said that it did nothing, then I should not have said that. It is stuff that we don't immediately know what it is for. Uh, this concludes, the, I think we have to conclude now because of the time. Thank uh, you all. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, around outside, so if you have more questions, you can just... Uh, please, please follow Bert outside. Thank him again oh. for this great talk. <laughs>